Um, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming, and um, welcome to the presentation of the Serling Institute Guide on Antisemitism for the MSU Community. Uh, my name is Ellie Baden. I am a senior at Michigan State. Um, I'm in James Madison College in the College of Arts and Letters. Um, and I'm here to tell you a little bit about the background of the guide, and then we'll get a little bit more into the details of how it was made, um, what the guide entails, and how we're, we're going to be distributing it on campus. Um, so for a little bit of background, um, so I got the idea for the project about I think it was about a year and a half ago. Um, so I was in a class um, and someone made a comment about the Holocaust. And I realized that the comment stemmed from ignorance, but it was still hurtful and it led to a discourse in the class that I didn't think was necessarily productive. Um, so I expressed my concerns to the professor and the professor also um, didn't seem to realize why it was problematic at first and I kind of had to explain it. And that made me realize that this probably happens a lot at Michigan State. Um, you know anti-Semitism that comes out of ignorance or not necessarily intentional, but it, we can use this as a way to educate people. So I started thinking back on past experiences I'd had with anti-Semitism on campus, um, being asked by a classmate if I had horns during my first week at school, um, you know, overhearing comments here and there, um, you know, and I heard stories from friends about comments that they had received or things that teachers had said even. Um, and it was really troubling, and it's part of a larger pattern on campuses um, across the country, and then also in the wider world, we're seeing a rise in anti-Semitism, and you know, you see and hear examples almost every week, unfortunately, and a lot of them do happen on our campus, even though MSU is a lot better than a lot of other schools. So I brought these concerns to Professor Aronoff and to Ariana Mensel, and I asked them if we could do something about it. Um, so I started working on writing a guide um, that could help educate our students and our faculty and the MSU community in general about anti-Semitism and why it's so important to learn about these topics and how we can prevent it. And um, after a few weeks into this project, there were some conversations in ASMSU, which were the student government of Michigan State, about a definition for anti-Semitism. And this resolution, um, which would have defined anti-Semitism on campus, was met with a lot of backlash. It became a little bit politicized. Um, there were some very tense meetings of the student government. And ultimately, it was decided that there wouldn't be a definition at Michigan State. And so because of that, we saw that as a reason to keep going with the guide and to make it even better and work even harder on it. So together, um, we put together a nine-member um, committee, almost a task force, and we met a lot um, during the summer and throughout last year, and we wrote this guide um, that you now have in front of you. And I'll pass it over um, to talk more about the process of what that was like. Thank you um, so much, Ellie. I'm Yael Aronoff. I'm uh, the director of the Serling Institute for Jewish Studies in Modern Israel. I've had Serling Chair in Israel Studies and a professor of international relations at James Madison College. Um, so as Ellie noted, this is very much student driven. Um, the faculty didn't, you know, uh, we were definitely were concerned about anti-Semitism that's um, increasing uh, globally and nationally on college campuses. Um, but we hadn't necessarily thought ourselves of doing a guide. Um, but because over the past six years, um, we've been hearing more and more from students on campus about incidences, and when we had started um, thinking about the guide, there had been over 80 incidences on campus that had been shared. And first, I would like to premise what Ellie said is that, you know, MSU is a great place <laughs> for the Jewish community to be. It's just that we haven't escaped this trend either. And we were kind of shocked by um, the things that we were hearing uh, and uh, eventually, just a year ago, there were three incidents um, that were compounded, bless you, um, uh, on our campus um, right around 9-11. Uh, and we, um, we actually made a statement. We had made statements in support of other groups on campus who had faced um, violence in our country and uh, prejudices on campus and alliance with them. And this time, we made a st we thought it was important for us to make a statement. But with this um, student kind of call for us to do more, um, we really decided to take Ellie, uh, Ariana, by the way, Metzl was also um, part of our work. She's a, a, our assistant in the um, office in the Sterling Institute and who was an assistant director at the ADL and has a lot of experience as well and used to be a Jewish studies minor. So in any case, um, we were, you know, through talks with students after the ASMSU events and meetings with different students, they really did 
um, call on us to do something. And we thought we don't necessarily want to push for an official definition of anti-Semitism at MSU. Um, there are kind of right now three different <laughs> definitions that are circulating. The most widely kind of supported perhaps uh, around the world is the IRA definition that the students had tried to pass. Um, there's then in the last few years been two alternative definitions, the Nexus definition and the Jerusalem de Declaration. And we thought we don't really want to advocate for a single definition. Um, we won't really want to build on Ellie's idea of having, because the definitions themselves are aren't necessarily um, in the context of the MSU experience and tailored to the context of the MSU experience, which we really try to do in the guide. If you look in the guide, you know, everything is interspersed with examples that have happened at MSU. Um, and um, in the appendix, there are also a selection of other incidents that have happened at MSU. So we wanted to tailor it to MSU. And we wanted to go beyond a definition or selecting a single definition and actually writing a more thorough, not too long, but long enough to actually provide a little more guidance in educating. And that was really what we wanted to do. We don't, this is intent of this is not to label anyone. Uh, that is the last thing we want to do as anti-Semitic, but provide some kind of guidance for the community. Because Ellie said, sometimes people are unaware or ignorant of the histories of these things, of the context of how it affects uh, often Jewish community members. Um, and of course, there's a divergence of views among Jews uh, as, on this as well. So we wanted to provide some context within the MSU. Uh, we wanted to provide a context within the MSU experience and provide a little more guidance than definitions provide. And so as Ellie said, we decided we worked throughout the summer um, with several other students, uh, including Chloe Shimano Cup and Andrew Shulman um, and other faculty members at different points like Mark Bernstein. We worked throughout the summer um, and we decided how we wanted to organize it, which um, is very much on kind of anti-Semitism in general. Um, uh, Professor Amy Simon, our Farber Chair in Holocaust Studies and European Jewish History, will outline some of the tropes that she teaches about in her classes. Um, Professor Kirsten from English is an American Jewish historian who's done a lot of research um, on Amer anti-Semitism in the American context, and she brought her expertise um, to it. So they bro both brought their expertise to it. Um, and I deal with Israel studies and, um, and have a lot of experience um, kind of looking looking at it within the Israeli, when you apply it to the Israeli context, which is often the most controversial part, is to how to keep it narrow but really delineate um, when things can cross the line and open it up to what it can be con constructive conversation. And my colleagues will talk about that. I want to talk a little bit more about the process we went through. So we worked throughout the summer, um, uh, invited any faculty who wanted to participate, any student who wanted to participate. Uh, we wanted to make it as inclusive as possible, which often, you know, uh, the great part is we made it as inclusive part of it. It also took longer and many more meetings in order to incorporate everyone's opinions. Then we met with our core faculty um, in many meetings to get their feedback and input throughout the process. Um, and then throughout the process in the fall, we also invited all of our faculty. So we have about five core faculty and 25 affiliated faculty. And they brought in their feedback. Um, and we definitely continually adapted it throughout the spring um, to account for a variety of faculty's feedback. In that uh, process, we also opened it up to feedback from Jewish Studies minors and representatives of the Jewish Student Union and Hillel staff and our own advisory board uh, and try to be as inclusive as possible in terms of the different people on campus who may be affected by anti-Semitism to have them react and respond to how useful the guide is and how we can modify it further. Um, and then we also met with Vice President and Chief Diversity Officer Jabbar Bennett um, and I had given him the guide before we wanted to make it public in any way like we're doing today. We wanted to make sure that he read it and we got his feedback on it. And he was really excited and positive about it. And um, that was really, really wonderful. Um, and so when we went through all that process and after we got his uh, stamp of approval, um, he was wonderful and he sent it to about um, 30 to 40 important stakeholders across the university in June. Um, well, I'll let others talk about that. Um, but basically, that was uh, our process, to try to be as inclusive as possible, to stress the education part of this, uh, not to label anyone, but to actually be a guide and, and give it in the context of MSU. And we also, in that process, not only kind of had lots of 
listening sessions and feedback and meetings with all these different um, stakeholders and so forth, but we also looked very carefully at the three current definitions, at um, uh, research papers that were trying to look at the differences and similarities among those definitions, um, also the nexus um, draft of the white paper that they did concerning Israel related things we looked at. We looked at the Association of Jewish Studies had a task force that was also trying to give up some, give, um, some kind of criteria and guidance. We looked at that. We looked at work that had been done in Berkeley and the Anti-Defamation League, other scholarship on anti-Semitism, and in the fall we had uh, a community uh, community discussion about contemporary research on anti-Semitism. So um, without having it drag for the next decade, we try to include as much uh, listening sessions in terms of faculty, staff, students, alumni, advisory board members, and so forth on our campus, and also looked at some of the scholarship and work that had already been done in it, and then try to um, take what we could that we thought would be uh, most useful in providing that awareness and education on campus, and we just want it to be a resource, essentially, for everyone, and we're thrilled um, to be able to kind of unveil this today uh, and share this with you. Um, so thank you so much for being here. And my um, colleague and friend, Professor, colleague, uh, Kirsten from English. No, oh, Amy no, Simon. Yeah, no, Amy I, Simon. I ruined it. Amy Simon. Also, Simon. Yeah, you're just <laughs> ruined it. Over. Also, Sorry. colleague and friend, as I said. <laughs> Okay, so again, thank you all for being here. Um, as you could probably tell, I mean, this was really a labor of labor. <laughs> I always say, I say to people, uh, it took a lot of blood, sweat, and tears, pretty much literally, um, to get this out. Um, so we certainly hope it's helpful. Um, and I wanted to start again, um, and it may be a little confusing if you're not familiar with these definitions that we're talking about. Um, there, there are public documents that not just say, you know, anti-Semitism is X, but they kind of start with anti-Semitism is X, and then they give different examples, which things are anti-Semitism, which things aren't, which things, um, you know, are kind of more controversial or hurtful to say which things aren't and and kind of making distinctions and that's where it gets really really complicated because you know people have differences of opinions is this over the line is this you know just anti-semitic or is it something genuine that we need to talk about and so I, I say this all because I'm going to start with a definition, but it's, it's one of these broad um, definitions that's also academic. And then the whole guide is meant to be not a this or that, this is, this isn't, but rather giving some historical background as to what kinds of things are typically anti-Semitic and why, where it came from, how it functions still today, um, and then providing some guidance exactly on how to kind of discuss through some of the more complicated issues um, in a productive way. So our basic definition, and we call it a working definition, there's also, you know, you can define anti-Semitism in a lot of ways, but we tried to be pretty inclusive. So we have anti-Semitism is rhetoric, discrimination, prejudice, promotion of anti-Jewish conspiracy theories, hostility, and or violence against Jews or Jewish institutions. So you have kind of a wide gamut of behaviors and, um, and um, actions uh, and you know, speech, kind of including all of that. And again, against Jewish individuals or you know, attacking a Jewish institution uh, just because it's Jewish, right? So it could be a place, right? It's often synagogues, graveyards, things like that, um, but also individual people. So the way we organized it was through a system of tropes. And the tropes uh, came from the work that Kirsten and I and um, Morgan Shipley, who's a professor in religious studies, um, wrote like the year before we did this guide um, uh, for the MSU Dialogue series. It's not currently being run, but um, at the time we wrote, um, it was a series on religious um, it, dialogues on religion, and it focused on anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. And so um, we had kind of two parts, and there was a lot of overlap. Um, and we thought about the kind of historic tropes or themes of anti-Semitism and also Islamophobia 
um, and how they, you know, where they came from and how they continue to function. So we did the same thing here. So I'm just going to go through a few of, I'm going to go through them very quickly. You'll have the guide to give you more information, or you can take my class and spend a whole semester <laughs> um, going into, the then you won't need the guide. Give it to your friends. Um, all right, so we uh, went through, and, uh, and these are the kind of major tropes that we came up with. And again, the guide is about helping people to recognize anti-Semitism when they see it, to know where it comes from, and then hopefully to be able to you know, uh, approach it, discuss it, you know, um, as in whatever situation they find themselves. So Jews as heretics, and this can be Jews as not whatever other religion. Um, I, we focus here, and of course the long history goes with um, Christianity, the early um, texts and ideas of Jews as Christ killers, um, and how that has played out over the years with enormous amounts of mass violence against Jews, including the Spanish ex ex expulsion of Jews from Spain, the Crusades, and things like that. Um, and then we talk about how it continues, and in fact, people on MSU campus, and this is something very important that Yael brought up that we did, is make sure that for every example, um, we included examples that we've heard of from students on campus. Um, to let you know, right, these things are not dead, even though, you know, maybe we're talking about something that happened thousands of years ago. Um, the tropes continue to this day. Um, the next trope is Jews as child killers. And so this is the blood libel, um, the medieval uh, accusation that Jews killed Christian children for religious purposes. And um, I shouldn't have to say, but I always make sure to say it's, it didn't happen. It's not true, um, but it has survived and it has been morphed in uh, recent times to you know the, some false accu accusations that, for example, Israelis harvest um, harvest and traffic Palestinian children's organs, like things that are just outside of regular discourse, political discourse. Um, the next one is one that's probably more familiar to everybody, Jews as greedy and avaricious. We know this also has a really long history, um, at least from the medieval period. Um, and, um, you know, the idea that all Jews care about is money, and of course they're all rich. And, you know, there's so many images of this everywhere, um, and even in the news. And um, I, the example that I wanted to pull out from MSU was from 2021, where a student asked another student uh, picking up a penny, what are you, Jewish? Right, and this kind of common accusation, or not accusation, but phrase, to Jew someone down. It's the one I actually never heard until I moved to Michigan, and then I, when I ask my students, they've all heard it out and about, um, Jewish or non-Jewish. So I thought that was very interesting. Um, the next one is Jewish bodies as malformed or subhuman. And I would say this one, uh, again, it has a really old tradition stemming from this idea um, you know, perhaps of the, of the horns and then, you know, also from racialization in the, you know, modern period, the 19th century, obviously the Nazis, right, took this to the highest, the Jews are, are not humans. Uh, but examples of how it continues today are like the Jewish nose and the stereotype, the things that um, still persist in the news. Um, tro the next trope is Jewish control, another I think very familiar one, the idea that Jews somehow control everything, even though they're a teeny tiny minority of people in the world, and this most famous was from the Protocols of the Elders of Zion um, pamphlet published in 1903 and then translated everywhere throughout the world, basically claiming that there were some Jews that had gotten together and wrote this pamphlet about every single detail of how they're gonna take over the entire world. It was a forgery, it was actually proved as such in 1921, Despite that, it continues to be translated and published today. So it's a very strong belief. Um, and there's an example from our campus. Um, for example, um, in 2020, May 2022, um, there was some graffiti, um, Jews did 9-11. So again, this gets to conspiracy theory too, the idea that Jews are somehow behind all the world's ills, in this case, 9-11. Um, Jews as radicals. So the idea that Jews are somehow kind of still trying to usurp whatever system uh, through their radical politics. So whether it's you know being a communist, if if you know in in 
both Europe and the US when there was a lot of anti-communism, Jews were seen as communist. Um, we have the example um, from the US, the Tree of Life shooting, where the Jews um, who were shot in that synagogue were um, they were supporting the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, which was helping people from South America immigrate to the United States, since the idea that they're somehow these left-wing radicals, again, like the puppet masters trying to control everything. Um, the next one is dual loyalty, and this is one that comes up a lot with Israel, in particular today. It's kind of the modern context that, you know, Jews in the U.S., for example, some of the, the Jewish lobby, you know, they, they don't care about the United States or what the U.S., um, they, they, they only care about Israel and they are pressuring the government in nefarious ways against U.S. interests to support Israel. But this goes way back as well. It goes back to the first days of nation states. Um, and I'm thinking of France and the French Revolution and the question of whether Jews could ever really be French or in Germany's case, Jews could ever really be German or Italian. It's always this worry that Jews were just Jews. So they couldn't possibly be loyal to anybody else but Jews. So way before Israel, but then it gets co-opted. Um, and anti-Semitism in the Holocaust. This one's particularly important to me as the Holocaust scholar. Um, and this can be a whole variety of things, but things from you know, anti uh, Holocaust jokes, which are never funny, but especially if you're telling them to, to Jews, it's going to be pretty offensive. Um, also, accusing Jews of being Nazis is a particular uh, form of, uh, of violence um, because, of course, of this traumatic past um, of the Jewish people, the biggest trauma, certainly in recent history, for the Jewish people things like swastikas being drawn here, there, and everywhere, right? So many examples of how the Holocaust gets used against Jews. And we have an example, which is kind of where this all started, where we started keeping track of anti-Semitic incidents on campus and having our yearly forum on anti-Semitism. In 2005, there was an MSU student um, who was angry that his Jewish friend couldn't give him a ride somewhere. And instead of just saying, you know, you jerk, why don't you give me a ride? He said he told his friend to take the train to Auschwitz, um, which you probably all know is a Nazi death camp, the most famous one. And so just like reaching for those, those Nazi um, comparisons. And that also can be involved with the Israel question as well. Just blatantly calling all Israelis Nazis, for example, isn't really about politics. It's more about wielding this, um, this nasty history against Jews. Um, and so one thing, I'm at the end now, and I just want to talk about the Israel section, because of course that was the most difficult and the most controversial. Generally speaking, people today know that Jews don't kill babies for blood and, and things like that that are kind of more, right? Even the Catholic Church came out in 1965 and said, no, the Jews didn't kill Jesus. So, you know, there have been certainly changes over time, although these tropes remain entrenched in society. But we were thinking about how to deal with this Israel section a lot. And there are two kind of things that, or I guess one major thing, um, thought that motivated us and um, helped us figure out how to frame it in a way, again, that's not shutting down conversation, which is what the accusations are against, for example, the IRA um, definition, um, but rather opening conversation. And so we use this um, quote or you know idea and quote from the Association for Jewish Studies Task Force on Anti-Semitism and Academic Freedom, um, demonstrating that we are really, you know, we don't want anybody to feel like, oh, if I say something, I'm gonna get in trouble. No, we can say things. It's just about how do we say them in a respectful and you know productive way as a university, right? That's what we want here. So this quote from the Association for Jewish Studies Task Force says, if one's position on Zionism and Israeli policies or one's position on Palestinian movements serves as a proxy for invoking hateful symbols and tropes, whether anti-Semitic, Islamophobic, or otherwise bigoted, and or acts as a litmus test for inclusion in activities or clubs, then the protections of academic freedom no longer stand. So it's kind of the line over which uh, we are hoping that people in the MSU uh, uh, community won't go, right? That it's not just about hurling insults at each other, it's not um, invoking hateful symbols just to do it, 
But, you know, if there has to be discussion about certain aspects um, of, of Israel, you know, often negative Israel policy, um, that it's about the policy and not just about um, these kinds of tropes that, that we've already discussed. And then the last thing was, and we have a whole section that I really want to highlight because it really gets at the heart of what we were trying to do, and it's the promoting constructive conversation, right? So the whole idea here is finding ways to promote constructive conversation around Israel. Obviously, the, the other parts of it are kind of more just educational. What is anti-Semitism? How does it function? And then the Israel part, because there is a, a very lively debate about Israeli politics and a lot of criticism, you know, rightful criticism, you know, bad behavior on the part of, um, of Israeli politicians. And so the question is, how can we talk about in, that in a way that's not anti-Semitic and also not Islamophobic? And so we try to um, outline that a bit at the end as well. Thank you. Um, all right. Um, so uh, to end all of this, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm Kirsten from English. I'm in the history department. Um, I teach um, American Jewish history. I'm really happy to see students here. Um, so it's nice to see you guys. Um, basically, what are we doing with all this? We've just gone through this. We've just launched for you what was actually an excruciatingly painful year um, for all of our lives. Um, however, we really felt like it was a productive and great experience in the end, um, and now we want to share it with everyone. Um, so we have made made print copies of these guides. We hope that you will take one, take a few as you go back home, share them with friends, share them with other people in your dorm room, share them with um, people in your frat, um, share them with people that you think will be interested, that they can use as a resource later. We have 400 print copies. We're going to be handing them out to all the Jewish Studies faculty on Friday. We're distributing to students in particular classes, um, in particular, um, uh, um, we've distributed them in James Madison. We've um, distributed them to Hillel. We've made them available at a 30th anniversary celebration. We've been bringing them to sort of specific places. We were going to make them available to Jewish studies minors. Um, so we're giving them to everybody here. Um, we're going to be making another 600. This is really something we don't mind if you take one and you're not sure where it's going to go. Take one. Just think it, at some point it will be useful to you. You'll you'll get out of a speeding ticket with it. I don't know. That's not true. Don't don't take that with you. I, I really don't know that. I can't promise that. Um, but really, this we really want to distribute this. We want to be able to share it with people because we did work so hard on it. Um, it's also, if you don't believe in paper, which people under the age of 50 <laughs> probably don't, we also have digital copies. We have a copy on our website. You can go to our website anytime. If you lose this lovely thing, you can always go to our website. It will be there if you want to sort of just check it out. Um, we've distributed the, distrib the digital copy to people, to interested stakeholders. Um, Jabbar Bennett, who is the chief diversity officer, as Yael said, um, at the end of June, sent um, uh, digital copies to all the important stakeholders. That's a word we're supposed to use. I don't know what it means. But important people throughout the university have received this, and hopefully they will look at it and read it um, and be able to use it. Um, also really exciting for us, he, um, in the monthly email that he sends around to the MSU community, he, he advertised our guide. He sent it around. He listed it. He's going to continue to keep it as a resource for DEI. This is actually a real... This is a real strength of MSU to be doing this. Not all universities are actually incorporating issues of anti-Semitism within their DEI efforts, right? Um, diversity, equity, and inclusion. You've probably heard that acronym by now. But Jews are not always incorporated in it, and anti-Semitism is not always incorporated in it. So it's a real strength that our DEI office is doing that, and we're really excited and enthusiastic about that. Um, we are doing training sessions where we're going to be sharing this with um, RAs. Um, we want to be available to orientations, um, possibly one credit courses related to DEI issues. We really want to be able to expand and, and, and use this on campus. And we hope that if you find a place on campus where people are doing this kind of training, like keep this in mind, like think about it and reach out to us. Like this is something that we're really excited to share with people and hope that they look at it. And then the final thing to say um, is that we have actually found just informally that other other universities are, are doing this as well and have reached out to us to ask to look at the guide, to, to think about it as a model, to think about 
maybe hopefully just using it so they don't have to go through a year of pain and they can just like distribute it on their own. Um, although we do think that the MSU specific elements of this are really exciting, but we think that this is something Colorado College, American University, UCLA, um, places around the country are actually thinking about doing the same thing. So we think that this is part of a larger movement. So we, we think that's a really exciting thing and it, ha it is being distributed to people in those places and hopefully it will have a real impact. Um, and then we're hopeful that we'll be taking it to German Studies Association, the Association for Jewish Studies, talking with other people, other faculty members, and really hopeful that the process will, will come to something. And But the most important thing is for people on this campus to like use it. So thank you guys so much for coming. It really means a huge amount to us today that you came and listened to this and that you think about it and, and take home copies. We should go, go <laughs> send them out, send them out to everybody. Thank you guys so much. So I think what we're gonna do now is um, take a break. Go use the bathroom. No, oh, no. Oh, so, questions. Sorry. Yeah. So, yeah, questions. Yeah, no, 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 I tell yeah, them they get a break. That's yeah, gonna we are happen. gonna have a, a break. We'll have a break. Before, we'll have a break. and we then we would love for you to stay yes. for our next speaker, um, Professor Sarah Horowitz, and um, uh, Professor Amy Simon will um, will introduce her. And these things are linked. We wanted to link kind of our introduction to then your. Um, uh, talk so please don't go away we're going to leave the live stream on just mute it and come back but we before we do that we can take an extra 10 minutes if you have any questions if you have any reactions we also could talk a little bit if you'd like on some of our recommendations and resources but first we wanted to open it up and see if you had any questions feedback thoughts or anything like that and if you do, yeah, if you do, there's a microphone right there, which makes it even more fun because you get to like <laughs> use the microphone. Oh, Go, please. Okay. Are there some forms of, uh, let's see, because I know there's controversy, because I have a book, Operation Paperclip, while the US government use Nazis and use them to fund or help the CIA and stuff and then of course certain things and then there's even agri like in uh, uh, Dr. Strainsolf there's a Nazi scientist who's an aggregate of probably several yeah. Nazi scientists the United States and other Western governments brought over so I mean are there entire and of course the distinguishing between pseudos because usually when I was a kid I thought about pseudoscience as being sign uh, you know magic versus but also the fact that of uh, 19th century uh, scientific racism which partially became and then even anthropology has its roots in somewhat Nazi I've heard not just in Germany, but Britain and the United States and France as well. Uh huh. Yeah. So, uh, but as far as the exact uh, question is, how can we, like, examine information from the Nazi period without necessarily reinforcing the beliefs or, or something? Because one of the weird things about the Nazis is they went to Guatemala and Tibet, places that did not have uh, people who were there, but uh, they looked. Uh, they sent anthropologists. There and of course you have to be very scientific because of course what we know about certain fields is so far ahead of what we knew say 25 30 and what, what we'll know in 25 will be miles ahead as well okay so well, the I'm, baloney to i'm gonna let the holocaust scholar <laughs> answer that although i might want to add something yeah sure um thank you for that and that is um that is an issue in holocaust studies for sure and i'll give you an example which is that Almost every year when I teach my Holocaust classes, I have a student who wants to write about Nazi race science. And what they want to write about is whether or not it was true, right? Or any like good, good outcomes from Nazi race science. And when those students come to me with those questions, I say, you know, I, I get it. Um, but, you know, it's all about contextualizing what was going on. And it's all about, you know, helping the students and also, you know, professors or whoever as they're, as people are studying and reading, contextualizing it within this, yes, um, pseudoscience. And not just pseudoscience in that, you know, things change in 20, 30 years, but all, uh, intentional pseudoscience, right? Yes, they, you can argue they believed it, but you can also say like this idea of Jews as subhuman, there, there was, nothing studyable that could lead to that conclusion, right? So contextualizing it in uh, the Nazi race theories and race theories of the time is really important. And then like the studies with the, you know, uh, in the concentration camps and things, the scientific studies, contextualizing it for students today saying, well, you know, if a, if a scientific study is not repeatable 
um, then it's not valid, right? It would never be published. It would never be so, you know, all these things they did in the camps, not only were they unethical, um, but they're also not repeatable. So they just don't raise to the standards of, of science. So I think that, you know, anytime you're doing something historical, but especially dealing with historical people or regimes that are, you know, ethically, morally reprehensible, um, contextualizing it historically um, makes it clear that you're not necessarily agreeing with them, but that you're interested in learning about what was happening at the time. Did you want to add? I, yeah, no, I would just add, I was looking at the images, and we, you know, we talked, for example, a lot about using images, right? And, and certainly there's a, there's a lot of debate about how you, how you do things like that, and we did talk about that, and I think we ultimately decided to kind of shy away, even though we are presenting the context behind the images. Sometimes the images are so painful that, you know, we actually sort of wanted to kind of distance ourselves from it. So I, I think you asked some really important, smart questions that we also grappled with as we, as we thought about how to educate people and make things feel real without sensationalizing or possibly replicating some of yeah. the hatred? I think that's a really good question. Or also origins of the, that, the bullies, which came from other nations, like British race. Like Islam, like right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, let's, let's first take some, let's see if there are any yeah. other questions. Yeah. Um, are there any other questions or thoughts or um, feedback? Was the live stream on? Yes. 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 I don't no, think so. No, it's not like a Zoom. So it's just more like a, people are watching us. Well, just while you're thinking about it, we can just add a couple points um, in terms of our um, recommendations and conclusions. So some of the things we were recommending uh, and some of the parts in the guide, I think that we also talked about that are interesting, is not only we have kind of what definitely is anti-Semitism, then we're like, well, other parts, and especially related to Israel, may be dependent on context and how to talk about these things, right? And then a third part, or what's weaved through and also in the end, is kind of just issues of inclusion that may not be anti-Semitism, but that have kind of a negative effect on how many Jewish um, community members feel on the campus. So for instance, the issue of religious holidays and when you have events that conflict with that or uh, important exams on those days. So we work hard to have MSU establish a more robust uh, religious observance policy. So we work through the DI steering committee um, and then uh, we continued working on that and we're um, in the process of implement, we're close to implementing that at MSU and we feel really good about that. Um, so that's not only affects Jewish members of the community but all um, members of the community who are struggling with these issues. So we recommended that and that seems to be coming to fruition. There are other issues of inclusivity to just be aware of things even if they're not, you know, directly anti-Semitic. Um, and so, and some of our recommendations also, um, even though uh, we're thrilled that, that um, you know, MSU is relatively better than some other campuses and that this guide is being used as a resource on campus, there's still so much we want to do that we're struggling with at MSU and also in campuses across the country that we want it to be part of even more institutionalized um, orientations for incoming students and other things. And so we're working on that. We've now been able to, um, all of us, um, uh, participate in workshops to train RAs, but we'd like to kind of um, influence uh, a lot more students and expose a lot more students to educating them about anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. And then we also have resources in the guide, beyond the guide, that people can use, videos, other readings if they want to read more, um, and especially also um, going to our website that uh, Professor from English mentioned, which is jsp.msu.edu, um, and you can look there for our many events uh, each year. So one thing to do um, is we have lectures and symposiums on anti-Semitism, um, but we also have things, events, and exhibits on lots of other aspects of Jewish identity, language, history, um, cultures that um, can just educate people more um, about uh, the variety and diversity of Jewish experiences. And then we also have, you know, almost 40 courses that do that same thing. And so certainly um, 
uh, Professor Simon's course on Jewish anti-Semitism or the history of the Holocaust or um, the, the several other um, courses that she teaches, um, if you want to take a deeper level and, and educate yourself more, are available as well as Professor Kirsten from English's um, classes on American Jewish history and many other classes that we offer across campus. Um, uh, or, you know, to be more knowledgeable, for instance, on Israel and the Israel-Palestinian conflict, to be able to discern these different things. We offer, I teach some of those, and uh, uh, our visiting scholars, such as Yuval Ben Simanesi in the audience teaches those, and um, other of us do. So I think all those, except for some people, we're a resource if you want to learn more. And also, we want to be a resource along with Hillel and along with the OIE office at MSU um, for any members who experience anti-Semitism, if they want someone to talk to about it, if they want guidance about that, we, you know, um, uh, our faculty and staff um, are also here to be a resource amongst others, and so we list that in the guide as well. Um, are there any other kind of questions? Uh, did you want to say no, something? What? No, I just thought the gentleman wanted to okay. finish his, his comments, so I wanted to let him go. Because some of the basis of Nazi science, I think, was, wasn't it based in uh, British uh, animal farm science from the 1870s and 1880s? Uh, and I think even most of us in elementary school may have done a uh, a thing because uh, uh, where we ha where there was like a prepared like a, a, a bird that was already and then it had to be like or or at least its 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 skull had to be examined because it was that was the thing the skull examining thing was something the British developed which I think the Nazis also misused and mostly because two Jewish bodies could be as similar and dissimilar as say two Korean bodies could be both similar and dissimilar and then th those two Korean or Jewish bodies two each, cross each right. Yeah, absolutely. And what you're um, what you're talking about is making me think about social Darwinism, right? So taking the ideas of Darwin having to do with um, genetics and and um, and evolution regarding animals and plants, and uh, applying it to humans, which you just can't do. And uh, and that was a huge movement against supporting the racism of the time and the kind of the two things, you know, moving together, the scientific revolution, the racism and, you know, coming up with this thing that sounded really very scientific, um, but, uh, you know, was was completely biased based on that perspective of trying to differentiate people and create hierarchies, right, of, of different types of people. So thank you. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Okay, sure. Do you want to do yeah. it? Oh, you do it. Go ahead. Sure. Sorry. Uh, I didn't mean to take it from you. No, 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 no. um, so, yes. Okay. So, we're going to take a break, about 10 minutes. And when we return, um, we are going to have a really important and exciting guest speaker, um, Dr. Sarah Horwitz. And she will be talking um, to us. And, yeah, we all expressed we love the title of this talk as well Loving Me, Loving Jew. Jews, gender, and the anxieties of belonging. And so we're very looking forward to that. Hopefully you will all come back and we will see you in about 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Good job. Well done. We need to give you a little star. Wait, 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 wait. Take, take, take. take, take, take. <laughs> You need to take one too. Thank, thank oh, you. <laughs> I don't have any. Ronan wanted to look at it, and I was like, I don't have any more.
It's, it's not even new anymore, but it, Jeff Filler is um, a stand-up comedy, and she wrote this one-woman play in which she acts out all of the members of her extended family, but the center of it is going with her father, who is a survivor, back to see the cats. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's actually quite remarkable. It, I, I think she made it God, at least 15 years ago. Okay. Um, it's called Punchy in the Stomach. Okay. And I think it's really strong. All right. This is humor. Yeah. But also gets serious. Right, right. Yeah, I will check that out. Yeah. Oh, look at that. Not having no electrician. Oh, right. that's perfect. That's good. I'm so excited. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> I will say, so we're excited because the PBS documentary started yesterday, yes. uh, the Ken Burns, yeah. and I had Rebecca. Have you seen it? I haven't. So I had Becky Erbelding from the museum, mm -hmm. who I'm friendly with from the museum, come oh, and great. talk to our class. And so tomorrow in class, we're going to watch two hours of it. We're going to watch the middle episode, and then on my other time, I'll watch the rest. But I'm, I'm just super excited. I mean, such a visibility plus, you know, my connections. It's just like, wow, you know, how fun. Holocaust Museum in Washington D.C. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. Is there one in Detroit? There is, I actually oh. take my students there. That was, Kirsten piloted that with her classes. And I take my kids there too. Apology for a statement of, from the Lutheran Church about the Lutheran Church, Martin Luther's cause, writing again, how they were misinterpreted to justify the Holocaust. And Martin Luther himself 
I didn't know that the museum had added something. I don't know. The only way that I can think to get the audio in from the live stream is. slideshow is over and the video in the slideshow is over, that's going to be used there. So after the fact, we'll move the mic over there. The oh, for the Q&A. And, okay. And please mention, it's not for the people in the room, it's for the rest of the gathering. Mike, we don't hear. Yeah, okay. Thank you. There's only one little part where there's sound, so okay. don't click. Okay. All right, let's get started. It's okay. five after. Great. You want to get started? Yes? My students left. Yes, I'm fine. I'll probably go sit anyway so I yeah. can see the screen. I don't think it, oh yeah, I guess so. All right, welcome everybody um, to our guest speaker, which I am very excited about. I hope that there are a lot of people on the, on the live stream. Um, and I want to say something first, which is that um, there are two separate YouTube links for this um, session. So. We are on this link from before, but there's actually a different link that went out in your email um, that is for our speaker, Dr. Horowitz. So please, um, if you are here to hear uh, our guest speaker, um, you need to go to that YouTube, uh, the other YouTube link. So you have to get rid of this one and go to that one. If you have it on your email, that's the easiest way. Find it on your email and um, press that link. Otherwise, I will read it out to you. I will read it twice. Um, so get your pens and pencils ready, um, and I will, um, I will start. Okay, it's https colon slash slash uh, forward slash forward slash YouTube, Y-O-U-T-U dot B-E forward slash five one capital U eight Q capital D A E nine W G. I'll read it again in a second. <laughs> All right. Second time. H T T P S colon forward slash forward slash Y O U T U dot B E forward slash five one capital U eight Q capital D A E nine W G. 